I'm here today with my friend David Somerville. David was the lead singer of the Diamonds back in the 1950s. Dave, nobody can tell your story better than you. I know that. Tell us, how did you become a Diamond? Well, I was a radio engineer at the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation in Toronto, Canada, and I saw some guys lined up to audition for a television show in the hallway, and I just asked them if they were a quartet. And they said, yes. I said, how many tunes do you have? And they said, three, down by the riverside, and a couple more. I said, are you ready for this line? Uh, would you step out and audition for me for a second? And they said, yeah. They sounded fabulous. And about a month later, I became part of the group. And our first, our first show was uh, uh, in December of 53 at St. Thomas Aquinas Church for a minstrel show, a Christmas minstrel show. And we sang three songs. At that point, I was, I was part of the group. We named ourselves on the way to the gig. But what about Stan Fisher? Stan Fisher couldn't make it. I was filling in for him, and we never saw him again. So, so you pushed the guy out, and you became the lead singer of the I Diamonds? Didn't, I didn't push him out. He just he became an electrical engineer, and he was studying uh, uh, ultimately, but he was studying for an exam the next day, and he couldn't make it that particular night. So everybody was happy. Serendipity. Okay. How did the Diamonds become the stars they became? Well, we uh, rehearsed for about a year and a half, and then we climbed into an old DeSoto. We drove down to New York City. We, we uh, won Arthur Godfrey's show Arthur, uh, August 1st, 1955, and uh, then rolled over to Cleveland and uh, met the famous Dr. Bill Randall, who discovered so many other people, uh, including the Crew Cuts, which he named, by the way, another Toronto group. And that was the whole reason we were in Cleveland, to meet Dr. Bill. Uh, he liked the way we sang. We did five tunes for him a cappella at the Manger Hotel. And uh, he sent us off to, uh, to Chicago the day after our audition for him. And uh, Mercury Records signed us. And uh, Why Do Fools Fall in Love, which was a song that, that Bill picked for us to record, became our, the first of 16 hits that we had on the Mercury label. We already had four hits in 56, and, uh, and uh, we were getting a, a, a reputation for being a, quote, cover group. Actually, I think we uncovered some music, but in any case, uh, we prepared four original songs to record. And uh, on the afternoon of before recording Little Darling, we learned the song. We learned Little Darling because we'd been called back to the studio to uh, rehearse it, this, this brand new tune that had been recorded, first of all, by Maurice Williams, uh, and uh, uh, it was just, it was a throwaway at 3.45 in the morning. We did one take. We had to be out of there by 4 o'clock. The drummer had already been released. There are no drums on Little Darling. And uh, four or five days later, we were in New Orleans. Bill, Dr. Bill Randall called me and said, congratulations, you got a hit. I thought, oh, wow, one of those original songs. He said, no, Little Darling. And we went, really? And uh, that's, that's now, uh, how I found Little it. Darling was the B-side again, wasn't it? Yes, Faithful and True was intended to be the A-side. Uh, but uh, people like uh, Dr. Bill liked, liked Little Darling, so that's the way it went. So you think that because of his choice, that's how the song got launched? Yes, yes. Okay, now there were four members that sang on Little Darling. Yes. Okay, Phil? Phil is... Uh, Phil's alive and doing well up in Toronto. Phil Levitt is, yes. And I hear that Ted recently passed away. Yes, about two months ago. And of course, Bill, the bass singer. Yes. He died about five years ago. Yeah. With Little Darling, though, you told me that was the biggest song of the 1950s to never reach number one? Yes. Biggest recording, as I understand it, in the history of the record industry to, to only get to number two. In the entire recording industry, you're saying? That's what I heard. And Little Darling, even to this day, now it's been recorded, that was 53 years ago, if my memory serves mm -hmm. me correctly. Mm -hmm. And you and I had a discussion a few months ago. You told me up through October 1st of 2010, mm -hmm. Little Darling had been downloaded off the internet this year. This year. How many times? 876,000 times. 876,000 times. That's just Little Darling in this country alone. The first the first nine months. Yes. That's amazing. It is. 
It's astonishing. So that tells us what a place Little Darlin has in rock and roll history. Boy, if I could just get paid for that, I'd be a happy guy. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm hoping you made more than $41.25, huh? <laughs> I don't think we got paid at all for the session. Wow. Yep. After Little Darlin, 1957, what are the diamonds? What did you and, and your group of diamonds do? Well, in December of 57, we had a conversation with Dick Clark uh, that went this way. He said the kids are doing a line dance and they call The Stroll to Chuck Willis's recording of C.C. Ryder, but there's no song called The Stroll. And of course, it was very easy to take a hint from Uncle Dick, so we asked Clyde Otis, who was a great songwriter and producer for Mercury. Uh, Brooke Benton's manager and producer. Produced uh, almost all of Brooke's hits, produced 17 hits in a row for Brooke. Wow. And a co-wrote It's Just a Matter of Time, etc. In any case, within a week, uh, he had written a song called The Stroll for us, and we had recorded it. We flew Fats Domino's band up from New Orleans, and uh, uh, once again, we had a, a, a million seller. After The Stroll, where did the diamonds go? Well, we, could, we continued to, uh, uh, to record and, and to travel. We, went to, uh, we toured Australia four times and uh, worked around the United States in some fancy nightclubs, did a lot of television. We did uh, uh, some shows multiple times. Of course, we did uh, uh, Dick Clark's shows both in Philadelphia and New York multiple times. We did Steve Allen three times. We just, we just uh, and we changed the other three members of the group by the end of, by the end of 58. Uh, had all left to do other things. Two guys went back to college to uh, become electrical engineers, the tenor and the, and the baritone. And uh, the bass singer became a uh, Bill Reed, uh, became a record promotion man in Boston. After Little Darling was such a big hit, you were on a bus tour. Irvin Feld promoted the biggest show of stars. Yes. Who was on that bus with you? It was an amazing bus. First major tour, Fast Somno, Chuck Berry, Laverne Baker, the Drifters, Clyde McFadder, Paul Anka, Frankie Lyman, Buddy Knox, Eddie Cochran, Buddy Holly and the Crickets, the Everly Brothers, and the Diamonds all on the same bus for a period of 60 days. It was a grand experience. I, I, I'm sure you have a lot of memories. And as a matter of fact, over the last 20 years that I've known you, you've told me so many stories about the way everybody interacted, the good, the bad, the, the great music. You had great times. Chuck Berry would do, uh, he would, he would uh, sit up front and he would do something with the uh, microphone of the, uh, of the driver? Yeah, well, he, he used to borrow my acoustic guitar and he would scotch tape the bus driver's microphone in the on position. He'd stick it inside the guitar to make it louder and we'd have these amazing sing-alongs. And who was the guy that brought the portable record player that would uh, play all the records, the latest records well, that would come out? I sat next to, uh, to Buddy Holly and, uh, and he, uh, uh, I remember on one occasion he had a recording of the Everly Brothers uh, singing uh, Dream, and they were sitting in the seat directly behind us. And I remember looking over and seeing a little tear roll down Buddy's cheek. You know, he was touched by the song, perhaps reminded by the girlfriend with whom he had just broken up, Echo McGuire. Why do I remember Echo McGuire's name after all these decades? It's a great name. Speaking of the girlfriends that they broke up with, Connie Francis. Yes. Sharon Sheely. Yeah. And I'm sure there are a few other. You know my history better than I. <laughs> a, few other, I remember it. a few other names that. Uh... Molly B. Let's not forget Molly B. <laughs> now, as you guys were sleeping in your seats, who was sleeping in the luggage racks? Uh, Paul Anka and, and Frankie Lyman slept across from one another up in the luggage rack. Paul, Paul was from Canada. You were from Canada. Yes. Paul caught up with you one day in New York City. Yeah. He had $500 that his dad gave to him to go down and sell his music, and the money ran out. That's correct. What and, happened? Uh, well, he came to me and he said, I, I have a really important audition tomorrow with uh, ABC Paramount uh, Records, and uh, I know you're in town one more night, and I need a place to sleep, and I don't have, I'm, I'm out of bucks. Could I, could I come to you? And I said, of course. So yeah. where, where did he sleep? Well, he, he, he slept in the bathtub. <laughs> okay, you may, there was only one bed, and uh, but but before we went to our uh, our separate sleeping quarters, uh, he said, let, "Let me sing you these songs that I've written," and uh, I'll, uh, he, and he did. He sang me about 15 songs, and he offered to sell me any one of them for 25 bucks. 
So how many did you buy? I could I didn't buy it. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I know I could, that. I could own the forest hotel now, but you know. <laughs>